Harwood and we'll be hearing from Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor. He's got a full statement later in the show. Now, plans to raise the state pension age from 66 should be shelved because we're not living as long as previously expected. That's according to a new report from the consultancy LCP. Until as recently as 2001, men received their basic state pension, currently £179.60 a week, from the age of 65, and women from the age of 60. Over the last two decades, those ages have been adjusted to reflect rising longevity and equality. So now both men and women receive the basic state pension from the age of 66. Under current plans, the age at which people are eligible for that basic state pension will go up to 67 by 2028, and then eventually to 68. But this new study from LCP says the rise in life expectancy we've seen over recent decades has now stalled, with the consultancy arguing the state pension starting age should stay where it is for the foreseeable future. Cancelling these increases in the state pension age or even delaying them by 20 years or so would benefit around 20 million of us born in the 1960s, 70s and early 80s. But it will cost the Treasury a pretty penny, an estimated £200 billion. In the pensions world, tiny policy tweaks can make a huge financial difference. There's certainly a debate to be had about if and when the basic state pension age should rise further. In the here and now, though, millions of us save for our retirement, so we receive a private or workplace pension in old age, as well as the basic state pension. Around 57% of us are investing in ISAs, that's individual savings accounts, and pensions for our retirement. Around 18% of men invest in ISAs and only 7% of women. Around 12% say we're investing in property, in property for our retirement, and another 12% of us are relying on, well, inheritance and or winning the lottery. Now, this research, compiled by MoneyMagpie.com and Pension B, also highlights that around 30% of so-called Generation Z, that is 18 to 24-year-olds, say they'll consider investing in property and ISAs to fund their retirement. Now, signs that more of us are saving, that's good news. The UK, along with many advanced countries, is an ageing society and we need to put cash aside. But the glaring problem, though, the glaring problem, around 15 million people, a third of all adults, have no pension savings at all and they'll rely solely on the basic state pension. Given that we've got one of the lowest state pensions in the Western world, that makes for a bleak retirement. And that's our on-the-money question today. As the cost of living rises, how do we encourage more saving for old age? Here at On The Money, we have grown up conversations with people who really know their stuff. We have Tom McPhail, the pensions expert at the Lancat, a financial services company. Good to see you, Tom. We have Becky O'Connor, head of pensions and savings at Interactive Investor. And in the studio, Jasmine Bertles, Miss MoneyMagpie.com herself. We're discussing her research. She put this research together on how people are planning to pay for their retirement. Let's go first of all to Becky O'Connor, Head of Pensions and Savings at Interactive Investor. Becky, just sketch it out, the landscape. 15 million of us with no pension savings at all. It's not a good situation, is it? It's really not, no. And it's actually quite an unexpectedly large number. You know, we've had auto enrolment now. So the expectation is that most people who are in the workplace have a pension. Um, but uh, from the uh, Money Magpie research and, and some of our own as well, we know that that's a huge, uh, not having a pension is a huge issue. Self-employed people obviously don't benefit from auto enrolment. And actually, there's still this cohort of people in their 40s and late 40s and 50s now who have worked their whole lives, have had a job. But haven't necessarily been auto enrolled in a pension um, because they missed out uh, for the most part of their working life on the auto enrolment rules. So we know we know where the vulnerable spots are, um, but the difficulty now is getting everybody up to the same standard and closing that gap. And obviously, um, that that is very hard if somebody is closer to retirement. Um, so yes, it, it is a really big problem, but it affects certain groups more than others. Tom McPhail, good to have you on the show. Uh, it strikes me um, as somebody that tries to keep a close eye on the pensions landscape 
that, yes, there's more savings going on, but there's still this big rump of people, maybe a growing group of people with no pension savings whatsoever. They're going to have to rely on the basic state pension, which is, isn't it, by international standards, pretty low. So uh, most of the people at an in, uh, approaching retirement today are, are mostly, not all, but mostly OK, uh, because we've had uh, pretty generous workplace pensions over the preceding 30, 40 years. So still a lot of people reaching retirement with defined benefit pensions. Um, the problems come over the next 20 years, uh, where increasingly we're going to have people reaching retirement who haven't had the opportunity to build up decent retirement savings pots for themselves. And, and as you know, Liam, the, the, the thing that really makes the most difference here is time. So almost counterintuitively, I'm less worried about the younger generations, people in their 20s and 30s. We've got some time to find solutions for them. We can keep using, building on auto-enrollment, keep building on engagement and find ways to help them. The, the ones that really worry me more than anything are the people in their 40s today who've probably not saved enough right now and for whom time is running out to build up a decent retirement pot. And, the, you know, if we're lucky, some of them will have bought a house and they can, to some extent, rely on housing equity. I was really struck by one of the numbers you quoted earlier on, that you've got the same proportion of people relying on a lottery win as relying on housing wealth, which just looks a bit bonkers to me. It's just, you know, so so I think there's a lot of cultural stuff we need to work on here, people's attitudes to savings. I, I just one final point. It's been really interesting seeing the way people's attitudes to mental health and talking about mental health have shifted over just the last few years. Really big change has gone on there, really positive. You know, there's no reason why we can't make the same kind of changes of people's attitudes to, to saving and investing. You know, that, I think there's evidence that, that, that it is possible to make a difference in this space. That's what you're trying to do, Jasmine Bertles. You're trying to get a conversation going with this research. Yes, absolutely. Conversations so that we can all talk about it. And, uh, you know, as, as they both said, um, th the young people actually are starting to, to look at this. And we were very interested to see that 22% of Gen Zers um, were interested 18 in 18 to 24-year-olds. Absolutely. Yeah. So they were into investing. Now, I think this is sort of the Bitcoin effect, Reddit, GameStop. You know, it's all quite fun for them. But I think also they are thinking to themselves that probably when they retire, there won't be a state pension. Mm. Whereas today's pensioners and maybe today's 50, 60-year-olds, they just assumed, understandably, that they, mm. the state would look after them. Something that Tom mentioned there, absolutely key in understanding this debate, the demise of workplace pensions, mm. occupational pensions. Tom mentioned uh, defined benefit pensions, yeah. which were the gold standard. Also, money purchase def uh, occupational pensions, which are more linked to the stock market, but still worth having. Mm. For people below 50, they barely exist these days, outside of the public sector, of course. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, it is basically defined contribution. But So you, you put money in and you hope that it does well by the time you, you get to retire. Um, I mean, as, as Becky said, the fact that we've had um, auto-enrollment has really helped a lot mm. of people. If you're, you're in work, if you're employed, if you're self-employed, mm. you, you kind of have to do it. And more yourself. of us are with the gig economy, right? That's absolutely. the danger. We've yeah. all got... We're, so many of us in the gig economy, there's a whole generation of people, the majority of them haven't bought homes because they can't afford homes. Yeah. The under 45s, we've discussed that a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's going to happen to them when they retire? They can't afford rent and they don't own a home. It, it is. It's very tough. And, and I think, you know, this is one of the reasons why the government a few years ago brought out LISAs, lifetime ISAs. So if yeah. you're under 40, you can put up to four grand a year into a lifetime ISA and the government adds in another 25%. So you could get another And then you get it tax-free. Yeah, which I think is you know, a pretty good deal, absolutely. So that's a help. But I think also that, that a lot of people under 40 realise that they are on the back foot. So you've got quite a few now thinking, OK, where can I put my money that's where it's going to make some money? Mm. But there is still a huge cohort that doesn't do that, and, and we want to get through to them. You're watching On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. After the break, we'll keep this discussion going with Tom McPhail, pensions expert at the Landcap, Becky O'Connor of Interactive Investor, and, of course, Jasmine Bertels of moneymagpie.com. Your emails are flooding in. This is an important topic. Many of you can sense that. I'll be reading out some of those shortly. Stay with us. You're on The Money. His family. Welcome back. You're on The Money with me, Liam Halligan. Today, we're discussing pensions after a new report from the consultancy LCP says we should shelve plans to raise the state pension age from 66 
because we're not living as long as previously expected. Plus, new research from moneymagpie.com shows there are signs among some of us of a savings uptick. So we're discussing how can we encourage more to save for old age. I'm still joined by my expert panel. Let's go back to Becky O'Connor, Head of Pensions and Savings at Interactive Investor. Becky, do you see a sense among younger people that there's going to, they should be saving more for their pensions? That's certainly what Jasmine is picking up in her moneymagpie.com survey. I wondered if you're seeing that at the sharp end where pension, private pension savings are actually bought and sold. Yeah, we absolutely are. So Interactive Investor, um, we had the, the number of younger customers using the platform to invest in both ISAs and SIPs has been rising um, over the last year in particular. And um, I think Jasmine's right to point out that the kind of TikTok investment trend may also be encouraging people to think about um, investing in general and investing in a pension and also this um, sense that the state pension might not be there for them. Young people feel like um, they're responsible for their own futures and they've got to do something about it. Um, and, you know, they're profoundly disillusioned, actually, um, about the state pension. And that may be prompting them to um, invest um, as much as possible in both ISAs and pensions, as much as they can anyway, because uh, obviously your salaries are lower when you're in your early 20s. Um, but it's very encouraging. And if that's the silver lining of the kind of TikTok, Reddit, GameStop craze that we saw earlier this year of um, People betting on GameStop shares, um, then uh, you know, then that, that's that's a good thing, um, and it's great that people are starting to understand that a pension is actually an investment in the stock market. And I think one of the things that's helped that as well is this kind of growing awareness of sustainable pensions and um, investing in, in the saving the planet through your pension, which is sort of growing awareness there this year as well that we've seen um, among users of the platform. Um, so there are encouraging signs, um, and as Tom says. Uh, it's not so much the younger generation who are kind of switched on um, to investment that we're worried about. Um, it's, it's probably those who missed out on both this trend and auto enrolment that is perhaps where the concern should be. If you had a, a couple of minutes in an elevator and a lift with, with the Prime Minister or the Pension Secretary, what do you think is the policy change we need to make to really get pension saving moving, particularly among those 15 million of us with no pension savings whatsoever? So, a uh, really good question, Liam. En engaging people with retirement savings is hugely challenging, and that's where the, the genius success of auto-enrolment came in, the recognition that we can hector people and we can tell people again and again that you need to save for retirement. We can send expensive salesmen out to persuade people to save for retirement. Actually, the best intervention was just to put everybody in a pension and everyone went, oh, okay, yeah, fair enough, thanks for that. Um, and interestingly, picking, picking up on Becky's point, um, the opt-out rates of people who've been put into a pension through auto-enrollment were much lower uh, uh, amongst the younger generation. So young people stayed in pensions. The opt-out rates were higher amongst the 40 and particularly the 50-somethings, uh, which, which I think is interesting in itself. Come, coming back to your question, um, the pension system is a mess. And um, Jasmine referenced the Lifetime ISA earlier on. You know, it's a good savings policy. It was a bit of a fudge from, from George Osborne in 2016 when he tried to review the pension system. But the whole, the incentives, the tax relief, the restrictions, the controls, it's horrible. It's a mess. You know, trying to, to just put simple, uh, 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 um, Clear messages in front of people, persuasive messages to say, if you do this, you will get that. This is here's a clear incentive. Do this, you'll get a top up from the government. You know, it doesn't work under the current system. So auto enrollment kind of worked, a bit of a top up from the employer, fantastic. But in answer to your question, I would just given a magic wand, I'd scrap ninety percent of the pension rules and I'd start again with something simpler and clearer and more compelling. Amen to that. Mm. Jasmine, you and I have talked in the studio a lot about the cost of living crisis mm. that's coming. Inflation's at 5.1%. It's going to go up more yeah. in the new year. It doesn't look good, does it, for people who aren't yet pension mm. saving? I mean, how do we? How, how do you think, with all your experience of money, on moneymagpie.com, we get to that 15 million 
share a third of all adults who have no money put aside for retirement. Yeah, it's a very good point. And, and I, I suspect that, that, that many of the people that, that Tom mentioned are female, that they are mothers, they're often mm. single mothers, and they, they are using every penny at the moment to look after the family. Um, so this, I think, is one of the reasons why we tend to see that women have lower um, rates of saving than men. Obviously, they often earn less as well. There are all sorts of reasons. Um, I mean, one thing that we've mentioned is that there, there are benefits. So if you if you really cannot, if you've got getting to pension um, age and you really cannot save anymore, it's worth going to entitled2.com, turntous.org. Um, they have um, calculators for benefits. You can find out if there are extra benefits. They also have grants. But I think, you know, going forward for, for the younger people, the middle and, and you know, coming to retirement, um, really just getting an understanding of why it's important mm. and, and even And making small a amounts. start. Yeah, making a start exactly. is so important, Any age. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, we've, we've done this book with, with Pension B called Help, I Have No Retirement Savings, What Do mm. I Do? And, and many, I, that is in response to actual emails that we've mm. had going, help, you know, I'm in my 50s, I'm in my 60s, mm. I have no retirement savings. And I say, start where you are, even if it's a small amount, Start with what you've got because it will build up over time. Well, we will return to this subject, Jasmine, with you and others in the new year. Thanks to my guest, Tom McPhail, pensions expert at the financial services company, the Lancat, Becky O'Connor of Interactive Investor, and of course, Jasmine Bertels, MissMoneyBagpie.com. None of us are giving you financial advice. We're here having a general discussion about the pension landscape. We're not qualified to give you financial advice or licensed, and we should just make that clear. But lots of you have been getting in touch about today's topic. Mark says, I was encouraged to pay into a private pension, then the government introduced the lifetime allowance. Who's to say the allowance won't be lowered again and catch out many more people? Steve says, people will not save when they know their savings will be inflated away by a government that prints money like water. Adrian says, I thought the government brought in that everyone in employment had to take out a pension. They certainly did. That's the auto-enrolment pension, which we referenced during our discussion. Paul says, you need to take young, teach young people about money and employers need to explain deferred pay to their employees. Compound interest should feature in basic maths education. I couldn't agree more with that one. And I think you too as well, Jasmine, you're nodding next to me. And Tricia says... Thank you for covering this important subject in such forensic detail. We do try, Tricia. We do try. I'm in my 40s with lots of little pensions from various jobs and would love to know some secure ways to find out what I have now 